Good evening. Great to be back after five weeks. And this lecture will be the Fuad Vash Batsara Flores and the Ilui Nishmat Shaili Yael Bat Moran, Itzhak Ben Esther Atzlacha, the Ilui Nishmat Ilana Bat Najat, and Zeev Ben Suraya and Shulamit Bat Yafa, and also the Refua Shlema of Bat Sheva Bat Menucha Mincia. It's been a while since we met, and uh, I had a very intense month in Eretz Israel, many, many lectures, radio shows, and I filmed the Shabbat film in English, which we're working now on preparing the film. Hopefully it will get to hundreds of thousands of people, just like the Hebrew one did. And uh, the sponsors of this project will gain a huge profit, Bezrat Hashem. We are... Uh, we just finished Sefer Vaikra, Leviticus. I have a few more things that I didn't speak about yet. That's what I'm going to speak about today. But before that, I heard a, a, a good joke, so I would like to make you smile before I begin to punch you. So, there was a doctor, he advertised that uh, he can solve any problem. If he solved the problem, you pay him $50. If he cannot solve the problem, he gives you $100. One guy came and he said, let me get some money out of this doctor. So he came to the doctor. He said, doctor, I lost my sense of taste. I can't taste anything. The doctor said to the nurse, give him B, B21. She takes drops, she says, open your mouth. She put few very bitter drops. The guy is beginning to scream, ah, it's poison. So, Baruch Hashem, your taste came back. <laughs> 50 bucks. The guy pays him 50 bucks. The guy said, listen, this guy fooled me. I got to get back my 50 and some more money out of him. The next day he comes back. He say to him, Doctor, no, what now? He said, I lost my memory. I can't remember anything anymore. I forgot who are my friends, people talk to me, I don't remember who they are. So he said to the nurse, give him B21. He said, no, no, not this again. No, said, Baruch Hashem, your memory came back. <laughs> give another 50, tough. This guy is broken now, he already lost a hundred bucks. So he said, I gotta save my money, you know. He comes the next day and he says, Doctor, I'm blind. I can't see anything, where are you? He said, have a seat, relax. Well, really, if you're blind, there's not that much I can do. So you got me. I'm gonna have to give you a hundred bucks. The guy say, okay, fair, at least you're honest. The doctor take $20. He put it on the table. He say, here's your money. Hey, you say 100. Why are you giving me 20? Oh, Baruch Hashem, your vision came back. Another 50. <laughs> this is the end of the wise guys. They think they fool the world and they fool no one but themselves. In the Parashat Bechukotai, we have something very interesting. The, Torah, the parasha started, Im Bechukotai Telechu. Im. What does it mean, Im? Im have 
in Lashon HaKodesh, few meanings, not just if. It's also when, Ka'asher. And this particular Pasuk, does it, mean, does it mean if or it means when? Or there's really no difference. When you follow my laws, I will bless you in such and such. If you follow my laws, I will bless you in such and such. There's really no nafkamina. But the question is, what, what did the Torah mean? The Torah mean if, or the Torah meant kasher, when? Let me read it to you. Do you know altogether how many salvations the Jewish nation will have? From the beginning of the world to the end. How many salvations? How many geulot? One in Egypt. Right? Second, from Haman. Haman. And the third, when Mashiach come. When Mashiach come. The word im, it's a big secret. It's Aleph and Mem, two letters. Aleph and Mem. The first salvation, Aleph is Aaron, Mem is Moshe. Those are the two saviors. The second salvation, Esther, Mordechai. Aleph, Mem. Esther, Mordechai. The third salvation, Eliyahu, Mashiach. Elijah, he comes to announce that the Mashiach is coming, also Aleph Mem. This word Im, it's a secret. What's the secret? Three times I will save you if you listen to me, if you repent. One in Egypt, second with Haman, and third when Mashiach comes. Your homework for next week is to tell me if the word E means when or if. Because it could be either way in a pasuk. Either way it manage well. If you say if, it makes sense. If you say when, it also makes sense. Either way, if you're going to do the mitzvot or when you're going to keep the mitzvot, right? I will give you such and such. So, we progress. You know, in this verse, right, the end of uh, Leviticus, what do we have more in a parasha? Blessings or curses? What do we have more? The beginning, it's short, few blessings, and right after that, a huge list of curses. What does it mean, that God loved to curse us more than he loved to bless us? Or is actually the other way around. The reason he put all this cursing is to help us not to, not to commit any sins. To scare us. Just like you scare your son, you tell him, don't drink this, someone put poison. Maybe it's something not healthy, you don't want him to drink. Someone spit in it, you say. Right? Let's see, somebody wants to drink. No, no, don't drink it. Someone, I saw someone spitting in it. Why are you telling him that? Because if you tell him it's not healthy, he's still going to drink. If you tell him someone spit in it, he's going to throw it to the garbage. You just save him from drinking poison. This is just an example. When the Torah comes with all these curses, obviously Hashem doesn't want to curse anyone. But he hopes that based on those curses, we will be smart enough not to go to that negative direction. But the question is still remain. Do we have in a parasha more blessings or more curses? What do you think? The answer, that blessings are mentioned in general. General blessings. Each general blessings can be broken to thousands of different blessings. Like for instance, if you say to someone, uh, I, will, I will give peace in the land. Do you know how many things you can get safe from if you have peace in the land? That means the economy will be better, and less stress, and less sick people, and less spending money on the borders, and less soldiers, and people can be with their wives, and they'll be with their children, and there's going to be more Torah. This is one verse that can, can, can be equal to a hundred different blessings. 
when it came to the curses, the Torah specified each curse specifically. He doesn't give general curses. Why? Because since the purpose of those curses is to scare us, if we're going to give a general curse, we're not going to be scared. So one, one time a person asked me, what does it help when Hashem punish me when I do something wrong? Anyway, I have no idea what I'm being punished for. No idea. You just drove now, Ocean Parkway, flash of a camera, 50 bucks right there. Oh, no. What? You drove 36 instead of 25. 36 is like jogging. When you jog, it's 36. They, they make these laws to, to rob people. The authorities don't care about the people, they just care how to rob them. So they design all kinds of speed limits and they put all kinds of tricks, trap, for the people pretending they care about safety. Pretending. So the question is now, whoop, 50 bucks in a second. Let's say it's a person who works very hard all day and he makes a hundred, a hundred and twenty dollars. There are many workers like this. This is like uh, three hours of his life just gone in a second. It's, it's painful. It's very painful. So now, why did Hashem do this to me? I didn't know there's a camera here. I just, I just burned 50 bucks for nothing. The question is, how will I know what I'm being punished for? If I'm beginning to look at the list of my sins only from today alone, it's more than 500. Which one of the 500 Hashem actually paid me for? This one, or this one, or this one? I have no idea. So what kind of a punishment? Punishment is supposed to be educational. You made fun at someone, Five hours later, someone came and made fun at you. You see the connection. Oh, Hashem is sending me a message. You stole from someone, you go back to your pants, and someone just stole the same amount from your pocket. Oh, makes sense. At least you get the point here. But if it's a random punishment, you have no idea what's going on here. You no idea. How is it going to help? What is it, strict revenge? If, if it's revenge, then why not paying him for all 500 uh, sins? Just give him 500 uh, punishments. That's what he really deserves. There are, you know, I'll give you an example. In Israel, you drive on a highway and there are cameras. Also here, same story. Speeding camera. Let's say in Ocean Park, it's the best example. You have about 20 cameras from one side to the other. If a person speed five minutes on Ocean Parkway, he gets 20 tickets. Even though each ticket is a, it's 30 seconds apart from each other. 12, 12.01, 12.01 and 30 seconds, 12.02, 12 12.02 and 20 seconds, $500 in less than two minutes. If he comes to court and says to the judge, come on, how many punishments are you giving me for speeding? I only spent two minutes. Two minutes, ten tickets? If a cop will pull me over for, for speeding two minutes, he will give me only one ticket. Now I'm getting ten tickets for the same crime. What would the judge say? Tough luck. You broke the rule in every block. You sped here and you got a camera. And you sped here and you got a camera. And it's your problem. Even though it's not really fair, it is what it is. It's reality. But if the judge would say, okay, pay only 50 bucks. But he didn't tell you for which one of the 20 cameras you're paying the 50 bucks. You should have paid the 1,000. 20 cameras, 50 bucks each, 1,000 bucks. The judge doesn't tell you which one. So, okay, pay 50 bucks and that's it. Does it make a difference which camera it was? It doesn't make a difference. But when it comes to the Torah, it makes a big difference. Why? Because when you get a punishment, if you know what you're being punished, you right away go and fix what you are doing wrong. 
least something good came out of the punishment. But if you have no idea what you're being punished for, how are you going to fix? You understand the question or no? Everybody understand the question? I see it takes you time to wake up, I see, after five weeks. Huh? You hibernated. <laughs> Beginning of the summer. Baruch Hashem. So, when someone asks you another question, I'll put them both together. Where is exactly the mercy of God? I'm sorry to say it, but I don't see any mercy. I see people become paralyzed in a second. I see children are dying. I see countries are bombed and thousands of homes being destroyed. I see 100,000 people die from heroin every year in America. I see so many kids that their parents threw them out and they live in shelters, in the street, in a park, in buses. I see a horrible government who control us and they're dumber than a shoe. All these Democrats fools. That's a serious punishment. Living under such a regime, it's a nightmare. In Israel is much worse now. Israel is much worse. As bad as it is here, multiplied by at least 10 times worse. In Israel, who really runs the show now is the Muslim Brothers. Today they nominated 36 officers in the Israeli immigration office. 36 Arab terrorists from the Muslim Brothers will decide who allows to enter Israel or not. Can you believe it? It's like asking the cat, come sweetie. I would like you to watch all the cheeses on the bed, on a, on, you know, over here. I'm putting the cheese on the, on a, my kids coming from, from school. I want you to watch all the cheese. Make sure not to touch anything. You say to the cat. That's more or less what's happening here. Someone who asks the cat to watch the cheese, no, that nobody steals it. Is, a, is normal or is a moron? It's a moron. So what do you think? The Israelis are really that dumb? Give them a little bit credit. Not a lot, but a little bit. They have no choice. It's a blackmail. You want to stay in the government? Pay us bribe. Without us, you don't have a government. That's what we want. And we want this, and we want this, and they ask 50 times more than their political value. They have only four seats, but they ask like they have 40. They hold you by the neck. There's nothing you can do. This is what Hashem did to us. The Muslim brother runs the show. That's what's going on. Do you know how many terrorists they're going to let in in the next few weeks if they still stay, the government still stay in power? Who knows? They're going to give ton, ton, thousands of visas to all kinds of mass murderers that are looking to come into Israel from Syria, from anywhere. There's nothing you can do. Nothing you can do that's going to be legal according to the law. It's my decision. Look what they have to agree to. Why? Because they are, they are so obsessed staying in a chair, in a government, in a power, that they're willing to let the country go down the drain. As long as they don't lose their chair. That's just to give you an example what a human, how low a human being can be. He would let his own country go on fire just for his honor, not to lose some of his kavod. So when I look at what happened in the world, I don't exactly see mercy. I don't really see mercy. But it's written in the Torah that God is very merciful. And one thing we do know, when something is written in the Torah, is for sure 100% true. 100%. Maybe he can talk instead of me, that guy over there. <laughs> I'm a little tired, but ask him if he can replace me. So, it reminds me that someone, there is an Israeli a scientist, a big kofer, a heretic, but very, very smart, meaning academically. Academically, is one of the biggest scientists in the world. He speaks in the highest level of com comedies. 
of all the leaders and all the top business people in the world, big companies, about the power of computers to be able to take over the brain of a person. He explained how with the artificial intelligence the computer will be able soon to know what you really want, because you don't know, you're confused. The computer will know better than you what you want, meaning the computer will take over your life. They ask him in the end of the interview, do you have a smartphone? How many years smartphones are out there? Almost 20 years, no? About 20 years. They ask him, do you have a smartphone? He said, no, 20 years I did not have a smartphone. They ask him, you, the greatest scientist, number one in computer in the world, you don't have a smartphone? He said, that's exactly the reason. Because I know that all the reason that they designed the smartphone was to control your mind and control everything you do in your life. They know where you are, they know what you like, they know what you're looking for, they know what you've done, what you didn't do, they know your bank accounts, they know everything about you. Much more than what you can imagine. I do not want everyone to know exactly every little detail in my life. So I live without a smartphone. I pay the price of not having a smartphone, but I'm free. Nobody know where I was, nobody know what I bought, nobody know what kind of belt I like to start bumming me with 500 belts every day. No one knows what I like, no one will tell me what to do. By the way, I think personally that everything he said is nonsense. Everything he said. Why? Because we know how Hashem runs the world. If computer will take over your brain, there will not be purpose for your life anymore. You will become a robot. You're not going to know what you're doing, what you're not doing. The computer will dictate for you what to do, what not to do. It doesn't make sense that Hashem will allow such a thing to happen in the world. Because it's defeat the purpose of the creation. Purpose of the creation is that you educate yourself what's right and wrong according to God's will and act accordingly. But if you all become someone that is being remoted by, by remote control, you have no more, no, no more purpose. So the world will have to come to an end. Has, there's going to have to be something that happens in the world. Personally, I think that the world is coming to an end one way or the other. I'll give you another example. They're working very hard on cloning people. They claim they clone a sheep, Dolly. Remember Dolly? Dolly, Alea Shalom. Dolly. Gadal vit Kadash Miraba. She already went to heaven. Dolly, with the Chachamim, with the Rashi, the Rambam. They all get milk from Dolly every morning. But now, they said Dolly was just an experiment. Dolly. Dolly. Now we want to clone people. We want to take Benji and make ten of him. That one, one can go to Queens, one can go to Brooklyn. We'll duplicate the rabbi to ten, so the rabbi will give ten lectures a night. One in Long Island, one in Florida, one here. So you go on, you go on, on YouTube, you're going to have ten lectures from last night. Same rabbi. Over here he wears a yellow tie, over here a red tie. Yeah, one, one lecture in Hebrew, one lecture in English, one lecture in Japanese. It's going to be entertaining. There's only one problem. This is a beautiful wishful thinking or planning, but it's all nonsense. Why? Hashem will never let it happen. Dolly, it's no big deal. Dolly is an object. There's billions of sheep, they all look alike. All donkeys look alike. All bears look alike. May, they may have different colors, but the shape of their face all look alike. Did you ever wonder why all Down syndrome kids in the world look, look alike? They all have the same face? Because we know that the, the view of the face of a person is determined by his parents' DNA. If he has two parents that are good looking, usually the kids will come 
either half and half or look like one of the parents, right? Size of a nose, shape of the face, color of the eyes. The parents decide basically, naturally, how you're going to look. Tall, short. You get it from your parents. It's in the DNA. How all of a sudden there are millions of kids in the world that are born from different sets of parents, complete different DNA, and all of them has the same face. Did you, did you ask yourself this question before or no? I'll tell you the secret. The face of a person has a lot to do with his purpose in life. When you come to the world, before you come to the world, Hashem is reviewing your file from previous life. Who you used to be. Let's, let's, call, in, let's call you now Yosef. Yosef lived in Iraq until 1980. 1980 he died. From 1980 until 1981 he had a trial. By the end of 1981, Hashem made a decision to send them back to the world. Sometimes it's instant, right away. Sometimes he put him on hold for two, three, five years. In a place in Shamaim, in heaven, it's called, it's called goof. Goof. Body. What's this body? It's like a tank. Like a place like a huge container that all the souls that are waiting to come down to the world are being on hold over there. That's what the Gemara say, En ben David ba'a ad shelo yichlu kol haneshamot shebaguf. The Messiah cannot come until this tank will be completely empty. Why? Because if there are more souls on hold to come back to the world for another reincarnation and another chance to fix, when the Messiah would come, what, what are they going to do? They're going to get stuck there. They can't stay there and they cannot come to the world. It's going to be like a catch-22. So first you have to empty that goof. Once all the souls came down to the world, the Mashiach can come. And then after that, there's no more reincarnations. After the Mashiach would come, there is no more souls coming back to the world. That's the final situation, meaning the final Gilgul, final reincarnation. Why? Because remember, after the Messiah come, there is no more evil inclination. First thing Hashem does, take the Satan and slaughter him, meaning eliminate him. It's going to be a big thing. Once the Satan, which dominant all the evil forces in the world, is dead, no more evil inclination to anyone. No one will want to steal, no one will want to kill, no one would like to commit all kinds of other sins. The Yetzirah is dead. And there is no more test. Now it's time of payment. The reward. Do you deserve to survive or I'm going to wipe you out? If you are Michalel Shabbat, definitely I wipe you out. If you're a rapist, I wipe you out. If you're a big thief, I will wipe you out. If you're an idol worshiper, I will wipe you out. If you're gay, I will wipe you out. But if you're a righteous person and you learn Torah and you're kind and you're charitable and you fix your horrible personality throughout your life, I would gladly give you a ticket to stay and enjoy these wonderful glory days of Mashiach. However, until it will happen, now Hashem decides that this Yosef, 1981, his trial finished, will wait three years until 1994, and then will come back to the world. Why Hashem decide that Yosef will wait three years and Yitzchak will wait nine years? And Moshe will come back in a week. How does he make this decision? The answer is, in order for Hashem to send the soul back to the world to fix, he has to find him the right atmosphere, the right parents, the right city, the right uh, financial situation the parents has to have, what school he wants this kid to go. Hashem designed his test. Not always the conditions are there. The conditions are not ready yet. Maybe the parents are not mature enough. There's all kinds of reasons. So he has to wait until the time will come. 
once the right time come, the wife of this couple conceive. Nine months later, this Yosef is born in a body of a new baby. And his parents, in the time of his breed, in a circumcision ceremony, the Gemara said that Hashem puts in their mind what name to call the baby. I remember one time I was in a breed by Rabbi Chaim of Shul in Queens. The owner, the father of the, of the baby was one of my, my, one of my ballet tshuva, Israeli guy, him and his wife. I had the schut to make them Shomre Shabbat, now they had a baby. So Rav Chaimov is, was in his shul, in the, there's a catering hall and down in the basement. This is something like 23 years ago, maybe 24 years ago. There was an Ashkenazi Moel, I don't know his name. And Rav Chaimov was holding the glass of wine to name the baby. So when his, Rav, Rav Chaimov said, Vikare Shmo Israel, and his name in Israel will be named, this genius Israeli student of mine say, Eli. Eli. <laughs> from one minute he made him from a Jew to an Italian mafia guy. Eli. Now I'm looking, I'm looking, I got so scared that, that that's not going to be the name of the baby. So I look at Rav Chaimov, holding the glass of wine like this. Ve'ikare shmo b'Yisrael, his mouth got stuck. You know, sometimes CD has a scratch. Kaha, like this, I'm, uh, 20 seconds. Then the name doesn't come out. The name doesn't come out from his mouth. The Ashkenazi Moel, clever, he recognized an opportunity. This Israeli fool, instead of being happy that he got the best name in Judaism, Eliyahu, no, not Eliyahu, Eli. Baruch Hashem was next to him, I grabbed his arm and said, Shtok, you fool, be quiet, you idiot. Ma Eli. So he, he, was, he was scared of me. <laughs> he didn't say anything. Five minutes later, he came back. He said, no, you didn't understand me. I didn't mean Eli, the Italian Eli. There is a Rabbi Eli in a Gemara. <laughs> you have to understand, this guy was a total ignorant. He never opened Gemara once in his life. So I guess he went and told someone we wanted to name him Eli, and the Rabbi forced us to call him Eliyahu. Why? Because he said that Eli is an Italian name, it's not a Jewish name. So somebody that knew Gemara over there told him, no, you could have told him it's Rabbi Eli, not Eli from, from uh, Bay Ridge. I wonder what's happened with that Eliyahu. He's supposed to be 23 now. Maybe he's getting married as we speak in Queens here. Anyway, Rabotai, a baby's come to the world. The parents have in their mind what name to call him. Once he's named, he starts a new life now. Another test. All the negative traits that he died with, he's born with. He was angry, he's born angry. He was stingy, he's born stingy. He was a not modest person with the ladies, he's born with his habit. Everything he was good with, he's born with that. Meaning, he was Shomer Shabbat already, never broke Shabbat. He has no desire to break Shabbat ever. Never. He, was love, he loved to learn Torah in his past life. As a child, all day he wants to learn. Everything he had for good and for bad, he comes back with. Why? The good things, he already passed the test. He has a check. You Shomer Shabbat? Yes. You put fill in every day, never miss a day? Yes. You walk with tzitzit? Yes. You eat kosher? Yes. Were you an angry person? Yes, big problem. You didn't fix it. You born krizioner. You know what's krizioner in Hebrew? Someone that has kriza. <laughs> Slang. You know what kriza mean? I tell you what what it means. When I was in Israel as a child, we had a Georgian guy, Gruzini, Yosef, his name. He had a kiosk. Kiosk? What do you call it? where you buy ice cream and candies and uh, bamba. Chaos, kiosk. 
This Yosef was such an angry person that even when you say to him, how are you, Yosef? It's none of your business. <laughs> that, that's how scared we were for me. Every time I had to go buy ice cream, I had to debate what do I want more. Do I want to get the ice cream but get a deadly look that for a week I have a trauma? <laughs> or better to give up my desire and get myself safe from the trauma? Especially an annoying kid like me who can never make up his mind. Every time I take from the refrigerator, from the freezer an ice cream and give it to him, he was very primitive. He had a big uh, newspaper pages. He broke them separately and he wrapped the ice cream with the newspaper. Now, do you know what it means that after I gave him chocolate banana, I changed my mind to vanilla chocolate? I said, no, no, wait, let me replace it. Wow, what a look you would get. <laughs> I promised you at one point, I said, the heck with this. Whatever I took, I took, as long as I don't get his trigger. Now, someone like this, Yosef, had a little yamaka, Tiny yamaka like Bennett. Now when he went to Shamaim, back then he was 70 something. If he's still alive, he's 120 now. Or 122. So he's probably already went to Shamaim, to heaven, and he had a trial. They asked him, Yosef, you were Shomer Shabbat? Yes. You ate kosher? Probably yes. Did you steal? Probably not. Did you work on your anger? No, I was an angry wolf. You're going to be born an angry wolf. How do you see? Look at the child. You take from him something, an ice cream or candy from his bag. Three hours, screaming, throwing. No! No! Ah! That's it, all supermarket is standing. The general, one year old, Itzik, the, the baby. Everybody stands online. What can we do for you, honey? He runs the show. Then his brother is such a nebech, like a, like, a, like a statue. Doesn't make a beep. But he, already everybody in the king the kindergarten that gets him angry, boom, punches, pull his hair. That's Yosef, the owner of the kiosk. He was born now, now he's Yitzchak. But the same anger. If he won't fix the anger, he will fail again. He will never have unlimited chances to fix it. He will have to fix his generosity and laziness and, and, uh, and uh, jealousy and all this bad midot. He has to fix it. Plus, to keep all the mitzvot. This is how it works. So now, when a person is born, Hashem designs his look. Some people, Hashem make them good looking. Men or women. Some people, Hashem, make them, you know, not exactly pleasant to look at. The question is, why does Hashem make one handsome and the other one a little chimpanzee? And one very pretty girl and the other one a little mouse. The question is, why? Why is it? Why he decide that this girl will be so ugly and the other one will be so pretty? This guy would look so good and the other one would look terrible, scary. What is this? He has a roulette? I'm afraid to say Russian roulette. <laughs> it's not in style anymore, Russian. Does he have a roulette? He, he said, okay, he this Itzik has to come back to the world. Is he going to be nice looking or bad looking? Let's see. Roll. The roulette, up, oh, fell on ugly. Itzik will be born ugly. Oh, fell on handsome. Itzik will be born handsome. But even ugly and handsome, there are levels. They are very ugly, they are a little ugly, they are very good looking and okay looking. There are thousands of different levels. The way you look is designed exactly according to your test. If you are a person that were not modest with the women and commit a lot of sins in your past life because you were very good looking, like Yosef Atzadik, if you didn't fix this midah, you have to be born handsome again. 
you sure who I'm so lucky I'm, I'm good looking. It's terrible. Because now you're in the middle of a test. You may fail again. If you're very ugly, no one would want you. Even if you want to commit a sin, for the years you would not commit one sin. Why are you committing sins? Because you're nice looking. You have much more offers. And that's the problem. Just like the Torah say, Yosef was very good looking. He was fixing his hair. A minute later, what happened? The prettiest woman in the world, a leech, right? Stuck into his veins. Ah, Yosef, how are you? Where have you been? Tell me a little bit about your family over there in Israel. <laughs> Next thing, the Gemara said, Gadim she lavsha boker, lo lavsha erev. Twice a day she make a fashion show. But it's not made in China clothes. It's all Egyptian cut and handmade by the greatest tailors of Egypt. Her, her husband was one of the ministers. Very rich. Very rich. They used to eat etrogim. Etrogim, only rich people were eating at that time. There's a lot of stories about her in a Gemara. So imagine, you're 17 years old, you are a servant in a house of a minister of Egypt that is gay. Potifera, the Gemara says gay. But he wasn't gay always. He decided to be gay at one point. He's married to the prettiest woman in the world. It's not good enough for him. His desire drive him crazy. He wants something new, like many gays today. They used to be with women. At one point, something went wrong in their box, and they decided, you know, maybe we'll try something new. Why? The level of hell that is waiting for them was not satisfying enough. <laughs> they wanted a bigger oven. Viking. They didn't want GE. Viking is, is harder, you know? has more G, GTU. GTU? That's what you call BTU. BTU. So anyway, Rabotai, so because of who you used to be, that's how you design. Sometimes your look is designed on how you behave to other people. Let's say you are very good looking and you make fun at ugly people all the time. In their face. Or a pretty girl making fun at all the ugly girls around. It's all measure for measure. You used to be pretty making fun at people. Now you're going to be born ugly and everyone will make fun at you. You used to make fun at fat people. Now you're going to be born with this desire to eat and you can't stop yourself and you're already 16 years old, 500 pounds. And everybody makes fun at you and you wonder why am I so unlucky? Why did I have to be born like this? I barely eat and look at me. Can't lose five pounds. Everything is calculated precisely by Hashem. It's a supercomputer. And that's how we design how you're going to be designed. But Down syndrome people, they don't have any test. They don't have Yetzirah. And then they are not here to pass a test. They are not tested if they like women to commit sin with them or not. Or to steal or not. Or to keep Shabbat or not. They are only here for punishment of what they did in their past life. It's a short punishment. They finish it and they go to heaven. Believe me. If we could be them, it would be better for us. Why? Because they are one step from the finish of the correction. They're very close to the end. To the end of the journey. We all feel terrible for them. Why he was born like this and I was born normal? It's actually the other era. That's what the autistic child told me 20 something years ago when I met him here in Borough Park. I t he told me I, I suffer a thousand tortures per minute. I said, I feel very bad for you. He said, no, don't feel bad for me. Feel bad for yourself. I'm almost there. I almost finished my tikkun. You people have a much longer journey to fix yourself. Meaning, yes, I'm suffering right now more than you, but it's just because I'm, re I'm reaching the ending point. So if you're not educated in Torah, how would you understand what's happening in life? Everything you think is good may be bad. And what you think is bad may be the best thing that could happen to you. 
So because they don't have a test, they are not tested if to go and make scenes or to make fun at people, they don't have that test. As you can see, they don't have a free will like a normal person. Therefore, they all have the same face. Because remember, the face has a lot to do with your test in life. It has a lot to do. By the way, also by the face of the person, you can read his entire personality. I just made a lecture in, in Hebrew, in Israel. It's called body language. And inside that lecture, I also spoke about the face and the look and the lips. For instance, people that have very thick, swollen lips. What does it show about them? Someone say the answer. That they are full of desires. Not just sexual desire. Desire for food, desire for all kinds of things that brings pleasure to the body. The bone, the bone, the bone. No, no, so the bone with that. So it's very interesting how a lot of women today in today's fashion, they already inject something to their, it looks like, a, like the tubes, you know, that you go to the pool. <laughs> you know? I personally think it's extremely disgusting and ugly. That's my personal opinion. It looks so artificial and so ugly. I don't know what they think it makes them look better. But that's their, you know, that's their choice. But maybe, maybe, I'm guessing, maybe it has to do something with what they really want to do. That's why they do all these things. I don't know. Maybe. Anyway, one way or the other, by the way a person stands, by the way his hands look, by the way he, mo he moves, by the way he walks, by the way he sits. I'll give you an example. If a person comes to sit and he falls <coughs> on a chair, boom. You know these people? They just re re release, boom, they fall on a chair. Every five Shabbatot, you have to call the carpenter. I have two chairs in the Shabbos table broken. Why? I have a son, he doesn't want to sit. He has to fall on a, on a chair. And every month, he breaks the legs of the chair. Why one person sit comfortably, slow, without falling on a, bed, on a chair? or on the couch, and the other one just throw himself on. What does it show about the person? You know what, I have an idea. Maybe next Tuesday we'll make that lecture here in English. That's a very good lecture. If you learn that lecture, it will help you tremendously in life to read people. For instance, I, already in a point in my life that as soon as I see a person, I know so much about him that I don't really need to interview him. Just by the way he talks about anything, I already know so many things about him. By the way he walks or she walks or the way they move. If you, kn you know right away if they like you, they don't like you. By the way they move the eyes, by the way the impression of the face. So you can learn so many things. When people are excited, you can see it. When people are bluffing, you can see it. When people are nervous, you can see By the way, the people in Israeli custom, they read you. They don't just choose one person. Me, they always call because I'm the only one who comes with a tie in Israel. <laughs> no one walks with a tie. Even the richest people in Israel, they don't like to put ties. It's hot, 100 degrees. So I come from America with a tie. They already think this guy is from Antwerp. Probably bring 50 diamonds in his bag. <laughs> hey, hey, Ata, come here, come here. So I already started to make experiments. Every time I put the tie, they call me. Now I decided, that's it, no more tie. Take the tie off. I walk, they don't look at me. So they have ways how they pick the people. One of the things is when they see a person sweating. i give you an example. There was a city of Jews and uh, they needed, uh, the, they told them, you're not allowed to cross the border unless it's a funeral. If you have to bury a body, we will allow you to take the body across the border. But no one gets a visa. We're not interested in you as a tourist. 
But if you need to take someone to burial, we will allow the coffin to go through. Jews say, okay. It started every week. There's a funeral or two. All the family goes crying. After a month, the goyim saw, what is it? Ten funerals every day, these Jews have? But none of them look sad. They all walk with a coffin. Hi, what's up, buddy? How are you? How's the market today? Up or down? What happened in the NBA final? How much he scored? Hey, you're in a funeral. Stop, stop. Open, open. Let's see what's inside. <laughs> Once the guy say open, all the Jews started to cry. Oh. <laughs> so now you're crying. If you're fools. If you would cry before, <laughs> you wouldn't have to cry now. <laughs> now when they open the coffin, they saw they smuggled things. Whiskey bottles, <laughs> everything inside. That's why they're not crying. There was a very good business, smuggling merchandise. In life, you have to know when to cry. If you cry on Yom Kippur a lot, the rest of the year you won't have to cry. If on Yom Kippur you laugh a lot, the rest of the year you cry every day. Why? Everything in life has timing. Nice haircut. Yeah. So, how did we get to this? It was such a journey we had. Ah, we already moved to 50 different states. Okay, so, Hashem sends the souls back into the world, and He designed their test. And he desi yeah, designed the test, and the people with the Down syndrome, as I explained, because they're not in a test year, they finish their tikkun very soon, and they go to heaven. That's why they all have the same face. It's very interesting. Let's move on. So, I started to explain that the Torah say that Hashem is merciful, but where is the mercy? Based on what we see in the world. So, and we do not know what we're being punished for. What are we being punished for? Tell me, what are you punishing me for? Send the punishment with a tag. Price tag. This is for insulting Moshe a week ago. This is for not waking up to Shachrit in the morning. This is for breaking Shabbat. This is for not watching your eyes. Tell me what you're punishing me for. Let, give me a chance to go fix it. What is the point of giving me an anonymous punches when I have no idea what is it for? How is it going to help me? How is it going to educate me? That's one question. Second question, where is the divine mercy? It's hard to find it. Based on what's happening in the world, so many people suffer. So many people are sick. So many people are poor. So many people are single. So many people are depressed. There's wars. There's all kinds of uncertainty. Nobody knows what's going to be with him in another minute. So where is the mercy? The answer to those two questions is one answer. That's what I say. I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. Where is the mercy of Hashem? By not telling you for which sin He is punishing you, that's the greatest mercy. Let me explain. When you have now, you are right now being punished. You lost your wallet, your credit cards, your driver's license, cash. It's such a headache now. First of all, you had $500 in your wallet, and it's gone. Second, how long it's going to take you now to get the license, to call all the credit card company, you don't remember their numbers, you have to go home and check. You don't know what's going to be. It's a lot of headache. Now you're thinking, why did Hashem do this to me? And you don't know. So you begin to think, what am I doing wrong? One, two, three, four. You analyze your life. And you came up with 100 sins that you normally commit daily. Lashonara, not watching your eyes, not giving tzedakah, not davening in shul. Rushing, 
not taking religion seriously, dressed like a goy, meaning not like Jews getting dressed, all kinds of ripped jeans and tattoos and all kinds of uh, weird, uh, you know, horns coming from all over, especially right here, looking like a mohawk, rhinoceros, you know. So where do you get all this fashion from? From Tony and Richie and Ahmed. And you get Hashem very angry at you. By the way you behave, remember you're his son, you're supposed to represent him according to the Torah, and you chose to be a goy over being a son of God. It's very disturbing. So what does Hashem does? He, do, he doesn't want to give you 500 punishments now, the way he should. So he's giving you only one. But he doesn't tell you for what sin. You don't know. Maybe it's for this, maybe it's for that, maybe it's for this. You have so many. So what do you do? You say, let me take things serious. Let me do tshuva. From now on, no more Lashon Hara. I'm getting rid of all these goish jeans. I'm cutting my hair. I'm going to be strictly kosher from now on. I wake up an hour earlier. I'm going to dive in Minyan. Right there you fix 40 things out of the 500. Why you fix 40? Because you didn't know what you're being punished for. If the punishment would come with the tag, you would only fix that. So by giving you one punishment instead of 40, you wiped out 40, pun 40 sins from your file. That's the greatest mercy. You know what the discount you just got now? One punishment instead of 40 punishment, one punishment deleted 40 sins. Because since you did not know what you're being punished, you made some effort and you fixed a lot of things. Not everything, but you're already a much better human being the next day. That's the mercy of Hashem. Nothing else. No one will get away from breaking Shabbat. Every time you broke Shabbat, you will be punished for sooner or later. There's no discount. Every Lashon Hara, you will be punished. Every penny you stole, you will be punished. Every little or large sin that you committed, there is a punishment waiting. There is no discount. There is no such thing, plea bargain. Okay, give me 20% and waive 80%. I'll give you 20 cents on a dollar. It doesn't work like this. There's only one way to erase the sins is repentance. Comes the time you take yourself serious and you begin to change and you regret and you dive in. And you ask for forgiveness, comes Elul, Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, and you really don't go back to the sins, okay, Hashem is willing to clean it from your file. No more punishment is pending. But other than that, they asked in Israel many years ago, Rabbi gave a speech that first three questions in heaven when a person goes up to trial, first question, did you set up daily time to learn Torah every day? Second question, did you conduct all your business honestly? Word is a word, time is time, money is money, payment is on time, no interest, no stealing, no deceiving, no replacing damaged merchandise with good merchandise, none of these tricks that many religious people do because they have this bad mid of stealing and not being honest. The second question is, did you conduct your business in your life honestly? And the third question, did you expect the salvation of Mashiach every minute of your life? Those are the three questions, and then, and then comes another millions, millions of questions. But first three, every individual. So the question now, somebody in Israel was a wise guy, and he asked, excuse me, Rabbi, David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, a communist, Mechalel Shabbat, eat non-kosher, has a communist ideology, is not religious at all, knows there is a God, admit that everything the Jewish people got, include coming back to Israel, is from God, even though he's a communist. I saw it in my own eyes in an interview that they asked him this question. 
but doesn't keep anything. Or at least most of what he is supposed to keep, he doesn't keep. So the student asked the rabbi, what's the point of asking Ben Gurion if he learned Torah? Ask him, why did you shoot at the Altalena boat and killed 16 miserable Jews when they came with a boat and brought some weapon to the Jews that they'll be able to defend themselves from the Arab and from the British? Finally, they came with massive amount of weapon. They didn't want to get into argument with the British. Yitzhak Rabin, the Prime Minister of Israel that was murdered, he was the general in a, on, a, on a beach. Ben-Gurion gave the order to shoot at their own brothers. And they shot them and killed all 16 Jews after they came from Europe weeks, weeks in the ocean with no lights, there's no electric. It's not like boats like today. Talking seven years ago. So Ben-Gurion murdered 16 innocent Jews because he wanted to be on a good term with these British that were in Israel. That's a mass murderer. Why do you start asking him, did you learn Torah? Ask him, why did you murder innocent Jews? That should be the first question. Then we go to all the other sins and crimes he committed. That's what the student asked. Why will Hashem waste time asking him, why didn't you learn Gemara? Ask him, why are you a filthy murderer? Why you murder innocent, miserable people after weeks they brought weapons to help you out? And you betrayed them and shot them. That's what you should ask him. Good question or no? The rabbi immediately answered him. That's exactly the point. If he would learn Torah every day, he would be able to shoot at his brothers and kill 16 innocent Jews just because he wants to be on a good term with the British. Care about the British. They are the biggest anti-Semite enemies of Israel. So let them hate us a little more. Instead of 98%, 98 and a half. How is it going to change anything? If they could get rid of us, they would get rid of us. It's not going to make any difference. Let them in. Shoot them. They asked Yitzhak Rabin when he was an ambassador here in Washington, before he became a prime minister. He writes it in his own book. I'm the fool. When I was young, I used to like to read a lot of books. 99% of them were total nonsense. The book of Arik Sharon, the book of Raful, the book of Rabin, all kinds of nonsense. I read his book, and he writes, he writes. People in Washington are asking me, the Goim, the Goim in Washington cannot believe that the general Rabin shot at his own brothers. They read the story of Altalena, Google it. Put Altalena in Google and find out the story. Unbelievable, shocking story. They ask him, don't you regret you shot in your own brothers and killed 16 of them? He said, no, absolutely not. The old man gave the order, and I was the general, and I followed the order. Just like the Nazis used to say. It wasn't my decision. Eichmann gave the order, or Rudolf Hess gave the order, and I was only the general, and I pressed the, the gas, the button. It got to him. It's his fault. If I wouldn't do it, he'll kill me. I had to obey the orders. That's what they say for their protection after the war. That's what the Ukrainians claim, but it's all nonsense because they were so happy to kill one and a half million Jews. The Ukrainian, they hated us more than the Nazis. They killed one and a half million Jews with no mercy, with such cruelty. With such cruelty. They were more cruel than the Nazis. Read some history. Now, after seven years, Hashem pays them for what they've done to the Jews. And who runs to help them and cry for them? The stupid Jews. Ukraine, oh my God. Don't we have eno enough problems with our own? Every day we are being butchered by the bloodthirsty Palestinian Hamas. There's so many miserable Jews in Israel that need help. Don't have a, a, even have food to eat. Why don't you ever run to help them? If Israel was a gold mine, the richest country in the world, and every one of the citizens has what to eat, medicine, place to sleep, and you have extra fortunate amount of money, run helps the whole world. Mitzvah, why not? Even if they're not Jewish, why not? Help every human being. 
It's a life. But you're not allowed to help, to help murderers, even if you have. You're not allowed to help them. That's a sin. To help murderers, you're going to be punished for that. Even if you have a billion dollars, and all he wants is $5,000, it won't make a difference in your financial. You're not allowed to help him. You're not allowed. If a Nazi come to you and say, help me, help me, you're not allowed to help him. What are you helping him? He killed your own grandparents. You're not allowed to have mercy on a cruel. If you have mercy on a cruel, guarantee you will be cruel to the righteous. That's what the Gemara say. Every person has X amount of pounds of mercy that he can share. If you use it for the wrong people, when the time comes and you need it for the righteous people, you have nothing left. And the best example now, it's the Israeli government. Today, another decree on the yeshivot. They don't do anything. They don't learn. Coffee, cigarettes, they sit there and do nothing. I cut 400 million shekels from their budget. There's no more budget left. What they get in a month, it's one dinner that you eat here. One dinner. That's their salary. One dinner. 270 shekel, it's 80 bucks. You go to a restaurant, one person spend $80 on a meal. That's their, that's their salary. From that he wants to cut now more. But wait. How much is giving to the Arab murderers who just killed us in the last month, 20 of us in the street? Few of them didn't die, they're in jail. He gives them 2,000 shekel a month salary for killing us. No joke. No joke. The Arab Palestinian who shot at people in the street is receiving 2,000 shekel. And one of them who came with a bomb on her body to blow up Israeli innocent women and children, she didn't die. An accident happened. She didn't become a shaheed. What happened? It messed up her face, which was ugly, made it uglier. <laughs> so now she doesn't like her nose. So she complained in jail to the Israelis, you have to give me money for a nose job. And the lefties waited online. Yes, Fatma, how would you like the nose? Richard Cohen from Manhattan, Isaac Levy from London, which Doctor, should we invite to Israel to fix your lousy nose, you rat murderer? For her, nose job. Nose job. If I ask them to fix my nose, don't, don't give me poison. What? Who are you? Especially if you have yamaka on your head, we'll give you a nose job. They put poison in your teeth. One woman, she's so evil, such lefty evil person. She was standing in the Knesset. She's already in hell, Baruch Hashem. She passed from the world. But, but when she was alive, she stood, uh, oh, she was, there was one religious man speaking on a stand. And she screamed, if I was your wife, I would make you a cup of tea in the morning and put poison in it. Immediately, without a second of thinking, he told her, if I was your husband, I would rush to drink that tea. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to be the husband of such a Nazi woman like you? Better to die than to, to be around you. She made a fool out of herself. So now we know, Baruch Hashem, where is the mercy, and we know why Hashem does not tell us which punishment we are being punished. We learned two very important things today. One more thing, it's written in the parasha, V'achaltem lachmechem lasova. You will eat your food, your bread, your food, and you'll be full. Meaning some people eat, but they're not full. You will eat a little bit and be full. That's a great blessing. First of all, you save tons of money. You don't have to eat 10 pounds of food every meal. You eat a little bit, half a sandwich, and you're full for the rest of the day. Fantastic. Very good. Or, Rashi writes, Rashi, 
אוכל קמעה, it's very little, והוא מתברך במאיו, and he's getting blessed in his stomach. The Torah promise, from all the grain that is growing in the Holy Land and the fruits, you're going to get a divine blessing that is above the natural way of blessing. Super nature. Super natural. What? That you'll be able to eat very little, meaning... But what do you care? There's plenty of grain. So I'll eat more, I'll enjoy some more. If I eat two minutes or I eat 20 minutes, I enjoy longer, no? Some people, they eat and they stick the finger in their throat that they'll be able to vomit, that they can fresh some more delicious food. So two guys went to a dinner and one was eating and eating and eating until <coughs> he's choking. I can't breathe. I ate so much. So the, the guy said to him, but there's still delicious steaks and desserts. What are we going to do? She should do like me. Stick the finger inside your throat, vomit, it will clear some more room, and then you'll be able to finish the chicken and the dessert. He said to him, no, you fool. If I was able to stick a finger in my throat, I would first eat that pickle. <laughs> the fact that I didn't press that pickle, that means the food is already up to my mouth. Not, not to my, this is it. So now the question is, what does Hashem care if we eat more, if we eat a little, if we eat uh, half a pound, or we eat two pounds of food in a meal? Anyway, there's plenty. The answer is, don't forget it was a different world. If you want to make a bread, a little tiny roll, it's enough for you. How much you have to grind? You take a, one, one bunch of grain, grind it quickly, put water, make flour, and make yourself a roll. Takes a minute, two minutes. But if you eat ten times more, you need to grind ten times more. Ten times more, meaning you're wasting time every day. Waste time because you need more food. Same thing when you go to the supermarket. If you eat very little, you buy a quarter of a pound of cold cut. It's enough all week. But if, you know, you like to fresh, five pounds won't be enough. So it means you have to carry more, and you have to cook more, and you have to prepare more. That's the blessing. One more thing. You would eat your food and be full, and you will sit peacefully on your land. Who can tell me why those two subjects appear in one verse? There's no comma between them. Do you hear me or no? There are two halves to this sentence. First, first half, You will eat your food and be full. And you will sit peacefully on your land. What's the connection? Why they're both in the same verse? Nothing to the one with the other. One blessing, you will have plenty of food, you will eat very little, and you will be full and happy. Now you want to tell me that there's going to be peace in the land, and we will be able to live in Israel peacefully, and no one will attack us there, and there's not going to be Hamas, and all kinds of other terrorists. Beautiful. Separate sentence, separate blessing. Why those two blessings are in one sentence? That means for sure they have a connection between them. This is a divine language. There's no random things here. Who can tell me what's the connection between eating and being full easily to sitting peacefully on the land? Meaning having a good living, good parnasa. You have enough money to feed yourself, you feed your children with no stress, and you will sit peacefully in your land. What's the connection? No. Very good. The connection is, Rabotai, those two depend one on the other. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to the Jewish nation, there's a double promise. 
you eat your bread and food and be full, your, your, your land will, will supply a lot of grain. That means you won't have any problem of making a living. You'll all be wealthy. Everybody was a farmer. Baruch Hashem, the land gave me this year ten times more than the rest of the world. I have plenty. Okay. And then you will sit peacefully in the land as a result of having enough food and be protected months in advance without worrying about what am I going to eat next month or in three months from now. There is no hunger in the land. There is no shortage of grain. Because if there is shortage, I will have to go to Syria and buy huge bags of flowers and bring them on my donkeys and camels all the way to Israel. So first, it's going to be months to go, to collect, until the camel arrive. It's going to be weeks or months. Second, you risk your life. People used to rob people on the street at night. He's going with his camels. Few robbers come with swords. Give us the money or we'll chop your head. Here, here is the money. And they're left with nothing. So that's a life risk to go and make a living in a dangerous area. So now that's what Hashem say. As a result of me giving you a nice living and peaceful and quiet and the land will grow a lot of grains and you're all going to be wealthy. As a result of that, you won't have to go overseas and buy food. As a result of that, you're not going to go into a war with the goyim or being robbed and mugged. You will be able to sit peacefully in your land and have everything you need. No one will mess it with you, why? Right? You're constantly ready. But if you go, what the goyim would say, oh, it's an opportunity to attack the Jews, why? They have hunger now. 100,000 Jews are in Jordan, in Syria, in Iraq, in Egypt. They went to look for food. Let's occupy Israel now. No one will resist. Everything is calculated precisely. So you see those two blessings are connected one to another. Now it says, וישבתם לבטח בארציכם ונתתי שלום בארץ and I will put peace in the land after the Jewish nation are promised by Hashem that they will sit securely in the land why the Torah have to say and I will give peace he already told us you will sit securely in your land that means there's going to be peace what do you mean sit securely in the land why do you need to add I will bring peace to the land. I will read to you the verse again. Right? You're going to see it securely in your land. And I will put peace on the land. One of the two is extra. Either you say I will put peace in the land, and we all know there's nothing to worry about, or you say you will sit securely in your land. And I understand because there's not going to be a war. Why do you need both? He's good. He's very good. He is good, Habibi. The answer is we're not talking about peace with the enemies. Peace among the Jews, which you hardly ever reached in history. Everybody wants to kill everyone. Not only the Jews. All nations are like that. All nations. Any place you go, there are ethnic groups. And they all hate each other. Even in Spain, Cataluni, Spain, Spain, Catalonia, I don't know, they have all these groups, uh, Basque, they all hate each other. The Arabs, everybody hates everyone. Shiites, Sunnis, this, that, Iran, Baha'i, Shiites, this, that, everybody hates everyone. Israel, Sfaradim, Ashkenazim, Litaim, Hasidim, Temanim, Rusim. A lot of Russians now. Everyone is a, is a ze'ev, a wolf, when it comes to others. But when the rockets fall on their head, they're all brothers. The Temani, the Hasid Satmer, the Vishnitz, the Moroccan. Everybody helps each other. Why? Rockets are falling. The rockets stop, oh, stink. 
where you can go in Russia you don't take showers no like in Morocco is any better go back to where your parents came from that's how they talk to each other rockets begin siren goes on hey Vladimir come help of course what happened they forgot about the racism so it's good the rockets maybe we should send a flower to what's his name the head of the Hamas send some more rockets you make peace among us he's doing shalom bait the Hamas doing shalom bait Hamash, we pay them by the hour. Marriage counselor. How do you make peace between a husband and wife that hate each other so bad that another minute they will murder each other? That's how much they hate each other. Every day they curse each other, they throw things at each other, they call 911 at each other, they try to poison each other, they scream and curse each other I have the magic way in one minute not two one to make them the best lovers ever in a minute even though 30 seconds ago they shot at each other and miss now I have this magic spell I go like this I put one drop on him, one drop on her. Oh, I miss you. What, what, what do you miss? You just wanted to kill me. I also miss you. I love you. And now, I'm Zug Yonim. In Hebrew, we have an expression, Zug Yonim. You know what it means, Zug Yonim? Two doves. Love doves? Love doves? No, oh, that's right. I guess it came from English. Love doves. Love birds? Ah, okay, good. Love birds. That's what happened when five people speak together. So, love birds. Tom, I guess the birds love each other, I guess. How do you do it in one minute, Rabbi? Is such a magician? So I'll tell you the secret. You invite them to a wedding. But you don't tell them the wedding is orthodox religious wedding. You don't tell them. When they arrive, you have this bouncer, this big gorilla standing by the gate. Hi, good evening. Ma'am, to the right. Sir, to the left. What? What's this? It's a religious wedding, separate. There is a wall between the ladies and the men. The men sitting here and the ladies sitting over there. What's the reaction? Ma? Ani lo yishev im baali? I'm not going to sit with my husband? What? Kfiyad atit! What is this religion? You're ruling on people? Moshe, let's go back home. Wait, wait. Let's talk to him. Sir, we, we are not religious. Let us sit together. I'm sorry. The man is here and the lady is there. I'm sorry. I cannot be alone without my husband. Ah, two minutes ago you shot at him. In one minute, <laughs> you make them zugionim, lovebirds. True or false? I tell you why. When you have Israel and Saudi Arabia, enemies, Saudi wants Israel to be wiped out. Israel maybe do not want Saudi to be wiped out, but do not want Saudi to be successful because they want to kill us. So if they are weak, we are happy. If we are weak, they are happy. We're not exactly lovebirds. Then comes Iran into the picture and intimidate both countries with the Ayatollahs and all the other wackos over there. Israel get panic. Saudi get panic. Israel and Saudi become best friends. That's the story of the wedding. Yitzhak and Rachel, husband and wife, who hates each other tremendously. But they hate religion a lot more. So when you force the religion on them, there is a third enemy who intimidate both of us. We have a mutual enemy. Let's make peace, Yitzhak. I love you. Here you go.
So how you make peace Israel in Dubai, in Bahrain, in Abu Dhabi, and now Israel and, and, and Saudi make business in billions now. Paradise. I want to ask you a question. The war between Russia and Ukraine, Many of the things that happens over there is terrible to the world and to each one of us. Look, we pay $120 a barrel of oil, $6 a gallon instead of two. That's uh, immediate results of what's happening there. There's a lot of other things that it's affecting our quality of life. But there's one great thing came out of it for the Israeli nation. Amazing miracle. Who knows what? Putin, we are very lucky that he has very high ego. We got very, very lucky. If Putin would be a humbled man, it won't be good for us. Because he has ego and nobody will mess with him. And if you mess with him, you'll make sure that you will realize and regret it. Israel now going to make hundreds of billions of dollars in profit thanks to Putin's ego. How? tell you how. When United States and Europe made sanctions against Russia that they cannot sell all kinds of things, they cannot import, you know. And they also made sanction against the oil, because Russia number one income is the oil. So Putin said, oh yeah? You're gonna mess with me? You have to buy gas from me, Europe. They all buy gas from, uh, from Russia. They need gas, cooking gas. You have to pay me with ruble. Why? Because the ruble crash. I want to bring it back up. We have assets. He has $200 billion. In one night, the $200 billion became $100 billion. The ruble came, fell 50%. All his money, he lost $100 billion in a week. I'm going to teach these lousy Europeans and Americans a lesson. You want to buy from me gas, even though it's his only result. I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's his only saver that they're going to continue to buy gas because there's no other income. Everything else is on embargo. He's supposed to beg them. I'll give you a discount. Buy the gas with any money you want. No, but you mess with me. I'm going to torture you. You have to pay me with ruble. But the Germans don't have ruble. They're not going to start buying billions of dollars in ruble every week. It's obviously not realistic. So now they're stuck without gas. Ten years ago, Israel found gas in the water. Enough for the entire Europe. So now, instead of buying gas from Russia, who are they going to buy the gas from? Israel. You know how with the food comes the appetite? Your wife said to, let's go in and grab something to eat. No, I'm not hungry. Okay, you just order dessert. But once he comes to the steakhouse and smell the steaks, okay, make one for me also. Why? You say you're not hungry. Being here and smelling the food, it's a different story. Israel saw now they're going to make billions. What did they announce yesterday? They're looking for another well of gas. Why? We can double now the sales. We have a lot of customers. Until now, it wasn't urgent. We don't have any, who to sell it to. So now, Israel sells gas to Egypt, to Jordan, to all over Europe, and to other countries. As, uh, I don't know, Azerbaijan, this, that, Turkey. <laughs> the tiny Israel is becoming one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Never mind that 80% of the Israelis are in negative balance all the time. Everyone is broke almost. 20% are very wealthy, 80% are broke. But the government is very wealthy. The Israeli, the Bank of Israel, they want to keep the dollar high, because the dollar almost went down to one shekel. How you prevent it? You keep buying dollars. What do you do with the dollars? Nothing. You keep them in a vault. They have $200 billion standing. They don't know what to do with that. To keep buying. Why they keep buying? Because if they're not going to buy dollars in the market, the dollars will go down. If the dollars will go down, the Israelis will not be able to do export. 
Why? Because America would say we have to pay you three times more for the, for the weapon we buy from you and for the high tech, on for, for the Israeli oranges, because until now a dollar would buy four oranges. But now the dollar in Israel is going down, it's only three oranges. And month, a month later it's only two oranges, we lose 50%. We don't buy from you anymore. Where are we going to go? India, Mexico, places like this that the currency over there is still low compared to the dollar. So if the dollar collapses in Israel, Israel loses fortune on export. It's a compl complicated thing. So the Bank of Israel, which is owned by the government, they are forced to buy dollars. It's artificial. Scam. But it just shows you how much they have, that they keep buying and buying. Ten billion a day, five billion a day. They have a lot of money. But they will never give it to the Avrechei Yeshiva. Nah, you're wasting too much money. You're making $80 a month. We want to cut you to 50 But the Arab terrorists, what can we do for you, Ahmed, as appreciation that you killed 10 of our children on the street yesterday? How would you like your steak? How do you like your pita? You want Iraqi pita? Lafa? No, no, no joke. I'm not joking at all. That's how they talk to them. The Arabs have leader in a jail. Someone from the Hamas that was a general, everybody is under him. He, he negotiates. We want hummus, we want labane, we want olive oil, we want this, we want... He gives a list. I saw an article, video in, a, in Israel, someone made about their, what they eat. No one in Israel eat like this. No one, even the rich people. You have to see how they sit in jail, play sheshbesh, eat hummus, eat meat, eat cold cuts, all kinds of goat cheese. They have the life. And each one of them has a cell phone. Ah, what? If you don't give it to us, we strike. We don't eat. No one will eat. We'll die. Up to me. Very good. <laughs> Fast. Die faster. Fast harder. Let's get rid of your lousy murderer face. Who cares? Let them all die. No, please, Ahmed, don't fast. We're afraid. Maybe ten of them will die in a week. And Sleepy Joe will call. Bennett, what do I hear? Ten Arabs died in jail because you didn't give them Lebanon and hummus and olive oil and pistachios for dessert? They like pistachio ice cream. Why didn't you give them chocolate? I'm not coming to Israel. That's what happened today. Sleepy Joe refused to come to Israel, even though there was a plan already. Until Israel will show some more compromise to these murderers. Do you understand what's going on here? It cannot get any nastier. But I want to remind you, this is all from Hashem. Hamas, Sleepy Joe, anti-Semite Europeans, Putin, I call baloney. It's all baloney. It's just like the business doesn't bring your parnasa. You invest in a supermarket, you invest in crypto, you buy this, you sell that. It's all cover up. Already was written on Rosh Hashanah how much you will net this year. That's it. Now Hashem has to make it in a natural way. You buy, you sell, stocks, this, that. Boop! Five, four, three, two, one. The year is over. A new Rosh Hashanah begin. Whatever is supposed to make this year, five seconds, four, three, two, one. That's it. That's exactly to the penny what you're supposed to make. You can make a dollar more, and you cannot make a dollar less. So all the running after money and the greed and the stealing and the, f and the scams and all, it's all unnecessary. Why? You're, you're scamming yourself. You're stealing from yourself. The Chazonish said the thieves are the dumbest people in the world because they steal from their own bank. Because anyway, what you're supposed to get, you will get. So if you steal, Hashem will deduct, for, deduct it from your budget. You stole 100,000 and you're supposed to make 300,000. Hashem will add 200,000 to the 100,000 you stole. But for the 100,000 you stole, which would come to you anyway, now you have to be punished for it. 
you're the dumbest person. You steal from yourself, and now you have to pay for the, for the crime. That's what's going on here. Now the Torah say, it will make peace among you. Eternal peace. The Gemara in Masechet Yoma say in page 9, what was the first temple destroyed from? What was the reason of the destruction? Three things. Idol worshipping, sex crimes, and murders. Did you hear what I just say? First temple, almost 2400 years ago. There were murderers in our nation. When I was a kid, no one was a murderer in our nation. No one. One day, an uh, Israeli female soldier got murdered. Everyone is, in Israel was shocked. My entire childhood, from age zero to age 21, that's, those are the years I lived in Israel. 21 years, that's it. And that's, I finished the army and I came here. In those 21 years, there were only two murders in Israel. In 21 years. Now you have two murders every 10 minutes in Israel. Every 10 minutes there are two murders. You cannot believe this. 10 murders a day. There were two, I can name you the two murders. Because it was so rare, everybody will, everyone my age will tell you the two murders. One was Rachel Eller, which used to be my babysitter. Poor girl. She was my babysitter. We lived in the neighborhood together. And second, Oron Yarden. I was kidnapped by some psycho and he killed him in the end. He was four years in prison. He came out of prison and died, this monster. That's it. Two murders in 21 years that I was there. Now every five minutes you hear, husband killed his wife, this one killed, why? Because you have a, a million Russian Cossacks and Ukrainian goyim with swastika. Swastika on the, on the neck, on the back. They shoot each other, they stab each other, they hit men, they go, they shoot, they kill. There's a lot of prostitution apartments. There's a lot of mafia, Arab mafia, Israeli mafia, Russian mafia, Kafkazi mafia. So many mafias in Israel. Ne families of crime. And they all blow each other up every day. Boom, a, 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 a car went on, on a bomb. Someone shot a few people. Every day, every day. There's now one day without murders. 20 years, almost no murders. But in the time of the destruction of the temple, the Gemara says, Shfichud Amim. Unbelievable. Who would murder? In the time there is a Bet Mikdash and you see divine miracles every day. You're able to go and kill someone? Yes. When you're angry, you kill. Sex crimes. Such holy people live back then. Still go and do such things? Shfichud Damim, Gilui Arayot, and idol worshipping. Idol worshipping makes sense. Why? Because the idols of those days were actually performing unbelievable miracles. Hashem gave the idol power to balance the free choice. Because if you come to the rabbi and the rabbi cure you, and you go to the idol worshippers and nothing happened, who would go to them? The only way to do it is when you see results. You have a baby that is dying. Some goy comes to you and say, let's go to my uncle tomorrow at 1 a.m., 1 p.m., Tell them what the baby is. He's going to give you special things that he puts by his statues overnight. Give the boy to eat. Put the boy under thing. My uncle is going to say all kinds of words. Abracadabra. Di -da 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 -da. And your baby is going to run and be live and kicking. And this Jew quietly that no one sees. Takes his little kid. Eats it. Don't worry. Tomorrow you'll be healthy. He goes to him. Ahmed. Mustafa send me. You say you have a way to cure the boy. Yeah, put 5,000 shekel in a jar first. Come to the back room. Say all kinds of things. Eat this, eat these herbs, this, that. And all of a sudden, he opened up his eyes. Like this. There was the Avodah Zarah. 
How do I know? Maybe I imagine things. How do I know that that was the case? There is Gemara Mefureshet. The Gemara says Rav Ashi, he wrote the Talmud. Rav Ashi and Ravina, two rabbis, conclude the Talmud. Rav Ashi gave a shiur in his yeshiva. Was teaching about all the wicked kings that the, the, the Jewish nation had and that lost their share to the world to come. So when he finished his shiur, he said, tomorrow we're going to learn about our friend Menashe. Menashe was extremely wicked. For 60 years he was putting idols all over Israel. His father was the most righteous king, King Hiskiyahu. The best king has the war son, like Yitzhak and Esav happens. Menashe is such a wicked king and he put so many idols, Rav Ashi say we dedicate the whole shiur just for him. But that will be preview for tomorrow's show. He went to sleep, who comes to him in a dream? Menashe. How many years ago Menashe died? How many years ago? Almost a thousand years. King Hiskia was 2,600 years ago. In the time of uh, Prophet Ishayahu, Isaiah, in that time, which is 2,600 years ago. And his son, Menashe, at the same time. And Rav Ashi, 1,600 years ago. He passed, about. So it's almost a thousand years, a little bit less. A thousand years passed. And the holiest rabbi in the world, Rav Ashi, that wrote the whole Talmud without computer. It's super divine. No one can do it. You take 5,000 greatest rabbis in the world, give them computers, software, and five years. They won't be able to write one page of the Talmud like he did with no equipment. Just from his head. It's, not, it's un 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 unheard of. Unheard of. So he goes to sleep, and who comes to attack him in his dream? Menashe. The most wicked king. Machti Arabim. Shame on you! How do you dare to call me our friend Menashe? Who wants to be your friend? You heard such thing? You heard such thing? I don't want to be your friend. You think you deserve to be my friend? Are you normal? You're the worst king ever. Such a rasha. You put idols everywhere, and you don't want to be my, my, my friend? What, I'm an idol worshiper? I put idols? I learned Torah all my life. So he asked him, tell me, if you're such a tzaddik, Rav Ashi, and you write the Talmud, you're such a tzaddik, I want you to tell me when you eat bread, when you make a bracha, motzi lechem in haaretz, how do you know what part of the bread to cut first? First cutting of the bread. How do you know where to cut it from? Yeah. Rav Ashi did not know there is such a law. So what? There is, it doesn't make any difference where you cut the bread from? I never heard of it. He said to him, you see, even something so simple you don't know. And you calling yourself my friend? He said, well, if he's such an important rabbi, Rabbi Menashe, right? Tell me where I should cut the bread from. He said, from the most well done pl place. From here we see that well done bread is more superb than a mushy, soft part. <laughs> the crunchy, always better. It's unbelievable how in every family, I, re I realize that, half of the members of the family likes the crunchy, and the other half love the salt. In my family, it's such a beautiful balance. I take all the crunchy and the hard and the burn, and my other kids, give me the soft, no, no, here. So we exchange. <laughs> you have burn? Here, I have. Give me, give me the soft. No, you have to give me the burn. We exchange, so we're all happy. Imagine if everyone loved the burn. It's gonna be fights. Everyone likes the mushy part. 
So, the first cut, they burned. Tov. He said to him, if you're such a knowledgeable Chacham, Menashe, how were you such a master of idol worshipping? Such a horrible sin with a death penalty and a cut for the soul. That's when he told him, you is, it's easy for you to talk. If you lived in my generation, meaning a thousand years ago, you would pick up your... Uh, What's the name in English of this long dress that a man? Clock. 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 I learned another word. Clock. Clock. Like a clock. Clock. <laughs> clock. So clock. You pick, you pick up your clock and you run. Sprint. Fast. To worship those idols. Do you know what a strong desire it was to worship the idols? Why do you think we're stupid? We didn't know there is a God. The nation of Israel didn't hear God speaking to them from the mountain. And right away they made the golden calf after that. The desire for idol worshiping was so strong because people saw results. You see results. Today the idols will give you nothing. Besides waste of time and money. You can stand in front of Buddha 5,000 years and beg him for one penny. Give me a quarter. I need to buy a cup of coffee. I'm, I'm short a quarter. 5,000 years. And naim naim velo iruz, naim naim velo ishmao. So those three terrible crimes. First temple. Second temple... Sinat Chinam, Lashon Ara, Gizanut, Gizanut, racism. The Gemara say, in the generation of King Saul, there were many, many scholars of Torah. But they didn't win the wars always. Sometimes they lost. Why? Because they had traders among them. They had lefties. They had Democrats. And when you have Democrats among you, it's the cancer inside the country. And it spreads terribly. What does it mean, lefties? Malshinim. They are very good in telling. Ra ra ratting? Ratting? What's the word? Ratting? Snitching. Snitching. Hey, hey, this rabbi is radical. He's anti-gay. It's radical. Oh, yeah? Let's investigate what he said in his lecture. Next day, a show on TV. The famous, you know how the, the newspaper reporters, they, I, I learned a trick. They all have the same trick. I'm, I'm sure they, they teach them that in school because they all use the same tactic. When they want to murder you in the newspaper, right, or on the television, Volkswagen backing. When they want, when they want to murder you, how do they start the article? First introduction. They give you an, they give an introduction who you are. No, they don't go right away to what they want to say bad about you. First, they say that you are the greatest. Like for me, I'll give you an example. The famous rabbi from social media that have hundreds of thousands of followers throughout the world and is very influential and gained a lot of power in recent months that just had a tour in Israel, in Tel Aviv and Herzliya and Yokneam. They give a list of many cities. He he is a serious danger. Why? He insults the Israeli soldiers. He attacked the gay community. He's anti-Muslim. Uh, he said that when Lieberman 
will die, we will have to make a party. <laughs> Why do they start saying the Hallel on me and then they begin to shoot their needles? Who knows? If you hate me and you want to put an article that is all lies and make up stuff and cut apart from here and apart from that and put them together pretending that I was talking about this when it was two different subjects, that's the tricks. But why would you start with the first three, four lines with the greatest introduction? Mamash, the best PR. I want to tell you why. When you want to crush your friend to the ground, if you throw him from the first floor, worst case scenario will have a little crack. You bring him to the 50th floor, while you're bringing him up, he, th he feels great. Wow, he's elevating me. And more, and more, and more, and boom! But that's not the reason. We will finish with the reason. What's the reason? If they will not make me a, 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 some kind of a god, godly speaker, then a lot of Israelis would ask, oh Americans, who is this anonymous guy, which I never heard about him before, that you're wasting our news on prime time with his lousy face? Why do I have to hear about some, re some religious rabbi, which I never heard of, and waste five minutes of the news about him. I never even heard about him. You want to speak about somebody? Bring me the chief rabbi of Israel. Someone that everybody knows. Right? So first they finish the Hallel. And in case you didn't know who is this rabbi Mizrahi, is the number one in the world today. He has hundreds of thousands of followers. He made... Many thousands of Baalei Tshuva. He's considered the highest in Tshuva world. That's how they start. And then the attacks begin. Credibility. Why? That's how they made rating. You know how many, how many views they had in the first few hours? The greatest they ever had since they opened that TV channel. 50,000 views. They usually don't even have two, three thousand. And today they ran it again, another 50,000 views. Why? People love gossip. Now remember, this is a channel that is so lefty that Bernie Sanders would be an extreme right compared to them. You know Bernie Sanders? Bernie Sanders is Meyer Kahana compared to them. That's how much lefty they are. They are the purest enemy of Israel, the worst. Such traders, such anti-Semites and haters of Torah, you never saw wicked people like them in a history. One by one, a lousy garbage soul, a trader, enemy of God, all gathered into one garbage can. They all, the worst people. Such deceivers, such liars, and they give you such a smile, preparing the knife and putting the oil. They stick it in your heart from behind. That's how they are. When you say to them, the lefties are enemies and are cooperating with the Muslim brother and destroying Israel, they look at you like you're some kind of a Nazi. When they say you have to kill all religious people, it's mandatory. What's the problem? And they play dumb. You want to kill all religious people? You just say it. I didn't say I want to kill you. I just say you're the enemies of Israel. You say you want to kill us. Who's worse? No, you are worse. Why? Because we say so. Who cares about the truth? Don't, don't expect us to even care about the truth. You may think in a world of uh, journalism, a respectable journalist the rights article would care about the truth, bring, in, uh, bring the right details, write the right words, not cutting half a sentence from here and half a sentence from that. And I'll give you an example. Mamash, we finish here. One time I gave a lecture in Parashat Pinchas. Pinchas ben Elazar Cohen. There was a Rasha, the pr president of the tribe of Shimon, Zimri ben Salu, 
fell in love with Goya. Midianit, Kozvi Batsur. A Jew is allowed to be with a Goya? Not allowed. The Torah said clearly, you're not allowed to mix with all other nations. She converts, it's a different story. Until she converts, she's forbidden to you. Especially if you're the chief rabbi of the tribe of Shimon. It's a big Chilul Hashem. So this Zimri, in the face of Moshe Rabbeinu, and the face of his family, include his parents and brothers and sisters, brings the Goya into Borough Park. Or Monsi, or Lakewood, whatever, you name it. Bnei Brak. No shame. He doesn't go to her, to San Francisco, to Las Vegas. No. He brings her to Bnei Brak. But no shame. So what did I say? Pinchas took a spear and killed them both together. And Hashem says, Shkroch. Very good. Hazaku Baruch Pinchas. I love very much what you did. He got what he deserved. Thanks to that, I will bless you and your children for eternity. It's a verse in the Torah. I didn't write it. I did not write the Torah. So what did, how did Pinchas stop the Satan from making Israel look so bad? He got up and he did an extreme act. Did Hashem approve it? Big time. In between the lines, I say, Pinchas, you know my humor, Pinchas say to, to Zimri, what, you became a reformed Jew? You became Bennett? Bennett is reformy, Bennett. What, you became Bennett? We don't want Bennett over here. What's the headline? That I would, I'm looking for a murderer that should go and kill Bennett, like Pinchas did, with a spear. That's, that's what they wrote in the article. How do you say asata in English? When you persuade someone to go and do an act. Manipulating. Instigate. Instigate to lie. Instigate. Maybe that's the right word. The famous rabbi instigate against the prime minister of Israel, calling him a traitor. Uh, it's hard to believe. He said, what, you normal? What's the connection? This is a story from the Torah, and I just made some a joke that Zimri was like a reform, bring a Goya into the room, in front of everyone, like the reform him do. And I use Bennett as an example of a, of a reformed Jew. By the way, he's not even a Jew, but that's besides the point. So that they actually now say that I actually tried to <laughs> manipulate people in Israel that they should go and take a spear and actually murder Bennett. Do you understand what filthy people we are dealing with? Huh? I don't know if to laugh or to cry. In the beginning it sounds like it's such a joke. But guess what? The police is in their pocket. <laughs> And we, we are wondering how come the, the law enforcement did not act yet. <laughs> wow, a, a, a Hamas Shahid came to town. He wants to drop a nuclear bomb on Bennett's house. Wow, 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 wow. That's who Israel is run by. And they said democracy, freedom of speech only to lefties, in parentheses. You're right, you don't have the right to exist, forget about to speak. In America, it's the same thing, by the way, of a not as bad. Same concept. Trump, we don't want to hear you. Why? We hate your opinion. You're radical. You're, you're an extremist. You're a liar. So what? I want to save my lies. It's a free country. Leave, leave the problem between me and God. If I'm lying, he is going to take care of me. What is it your business? Don't listen to me. You don't like my lies? Don't listen. You don't like my voice? Don't listen. You don't like my opinion? Bad mouth me. Say that my opinions are crazy. But why you block my mouth? Why you shut my channel? Because you know I will defeat you in any given moment. So when you lose... You become dirty. You do dirty tricks. That's what they do. 
That's the media of today. If you remember two years ago, I said right here that if I was Trump, I would open my own social media. Remember that or no? He got the point. He opened his own social media. He doesn't need them now. It's his. He can do whatever he wants. He can put anyone he wants. America, you can be a Nazi, stand by the synagogue and scream dead to Jews. And no, the police won't touch you. Based on me saying about Pinchas, it's already an attempted murder. <laughs> Imagine I would stand by his house with a sign, dead to Bennett, dead to Bennett. Wow, what would happen to me? They would gather me in a box, my bones and my legs, my head separately, put everything in a bag and bring it, you know. The police would break every bone of you. Why? So I ask a legal expert today, the police is cooperating with this lefty scam? They are puppets. They get an order from the general who is under one of the lefty ministers. I'm going to fire you. This is what you do and obey what I say. And there's nothing he can do about it. He only cares about his job and his pension. He's a righty! But he served the lefties to destroy Israel and give Israel to the Arabs. Why? He doesn't want to lose his pension. Now we're all going to die, it doesn't matter. As long as he has his pension in hell. Maybe they're going to send him the pension when he's going to be in a Viking over there. <laughs> On a roll. The shawarma roll. You know? Huh? We finish with a joke after this sad news, not to send you the press home. One uh, politician, a lefty, had an unbelievable support. It's a lot of lefties. So he got elected. One day he died. It's very wicked when it comes to religion. But he had a lot of fans, a lot of voters. He comes to his trial by Hashem. And Hashem said to him, listen, even though you're such a wicked person and you didn't keep the Torah and mitzvot, even though you're a Jew and you didn't care about religion, but I have a dilemma now. It's a catch-22. I cannot send you to heaven because you never kept mitzvot, but I cannot send you to hell because so many people are voting for you. You have a lot of fans. I don't want to upset them knowing that you're going to be on a gyro. So what are we going to do? I'll give you a special visa. Here is the visa. You put it in your hand. And you will go and see heaven. And then you go and see hell. And you tell us which place you prefer. Fair Hashem, fair. I, I like that idea. Where would you like to start with? He said, hell. I want to see hell, then I want to see heaven. So, okay, angel, Gabriel, take him over there, show him hell. He takes him to hell, open the curtain, lake, jet ski, yacht, sunny day, cocktails, dancers. Beautiful, wow, people with nice clothes. Music, fantastic, Mamash Miami Beach. You sure it's hell? Yeah, that's hell. All these people are the, the all wicked people who came to hell. Yeah, yeah. That's why they're here. You sure? Yeah, yeah. No problem. Show me now heaven. Come. They open the curtain of heaven. What does he see? Ten thousand Hasidim. Like this. I'm a rabbi. No, yo, 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 yo. I'm allergic to these people. I can't be here. That's heaven. No, no, no. Take me back. You sure? Yeah, you want to go to hell? Yeah. Sign here. Sign, sign. You know, the lawyers, 20 hours, you sign the papers. After all the signing were done, let him go. Opened the curtain, pushed him in. What happened to Miami? 
became Ukraine. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is burned, people depressed, fire everywhere, desert, thorns, le lizards, snakes. What's this? Welcome to hell. Come on. Where is the cocktail, the drinks, the music? The, the band, the guitar, where, what's happening? The jet ski, what happened? There was before the election. <laughs> now it's after the election. Before the election is a paradise. We will give you, we will do, we will promote. Today they decided to give 30 million shekel bonus to the gay community in Israel. All Israelis voted yes. You know, it's a, it's a government that is shatnes, lefty, righty, everyone together with the Arabs. Who stopped the approval of the plan? The Arab terrorist. Ra'am. Mahmoud Abbas. Mah Mansour Abbas, sorry. Mansour Abbas. It's against our ideology. It's against the religion. We cannot support such an act of Saddam. As an embarrassment. I don't know where to bury myself from the shame. The children of God, the children of Abraham and Isaac and Yaakov became so filthy that all they care about is how to promote sodomized all over the world and destroy the world. And those murderers that slaughtered the neck of babies with no, no hesitation saying it's too dirty. Too dirty that a man would dance with another man and walk in the street. It's contaminated our community. That's his words. And I wonder how Hashem can still stand us. It's a miracle. Miracle. The answer is only thanks to the Torah learners. Only. It's 200,000 people who sit and learn Torah nonstop. That's a big power. For now, it prevents another Holocaust. For now, how long it will remain, I don't know. You don't know if to laugh, if to cry. You don't know anymore what to do. It's so depressing. It's so depressing when you see what's happening here. And there's nowhere to run to. You can run to America. You cannot run to Europe. You cannot run to Israel. Where are you going to run to? In Saudi Arabia, you're going to have this garbage. In China, you're going to have this garbage. In Korea, you're going to have this garbage. In Iran, you're going to have this garbage. In Russia, Russia, it's Europe. In Hungary, you're going to be able to say the word gays in public. It will be the end of your life. You're done. Don't bring us this act of Saddam's and don't bring it next to our children. Murderers who throw bombs at children have more morality than us, the chosen nation. And then when a tragedy will happen, everybody would say, where was God when it happened? God was exactly where he was supposed to be, and he's the one who brought it on you because of how you behave. And that's what King Solomon say, Ivelet Adam. Tesalef Darko, Ve'al Hashem is aflibo. Translation, the stupidity of a person will turn him away from the right path. And who is going to, to blame for it? God. When he's going to get his punishment for going off the track, he's instead of blaming himself for choosing the wrong direction, He's going to blame God for punishing him for his choice instead of taking responsibility. That's the nature of people. They always like to throw the blame on someone else. It's her fault. It's his fault. Adam threw it on Eve. She threw it on a snake. No one took responsibility. When Shmuel came to Saul, King Saul, what is this? You didn't kill Amalek? Why the sheep is still alive? The nation wanted to bring sacrifices to Hashem. But it was your obligation. Why do I care about what the nation wants? You're the king. 
the nation, the nation didn't want to kill so many sheep. The only one who took responsibility was King David. Once Shmuel told him, it's you the man, with Uriah Chiti, immediately he did tshuva and took responsibility. Most people don't take responsibility. One of the greatest things about a person that is honest enough to admit, it's my fault, I take full responsibility. What's easier for a person to say to his friend? Two friends are arguing. Male, female, doesn't matter. They're arguing. A heated argument. Reuven and Shimon. They're about to flip the table in each, each other's face. In the end, they, okay, they reach an agreement. Shimon wants to confess that Reuven is right. What's easier for him to say? You are right? Or it's easier to say I was wrong? If you have an argument with your friend and you know he's right, but your ego doesn't let you admit for an hour, in the end you see that he's stubborn, he's not letting you get away with that. And you know he's right. So you say, okay, let me just admit. But how am I going to admit? Should I say to him, okay, Reuven, you're right? Or I should say to him, you're right, I was wrong. Which one is easier to say? You are right or I was wrong? Huh? What do you think? It's easier to say you are right. It's very hard to say I was wrong. Why? Well, it's the same meaning. It's the same. You want the argument. Either way, you want the argument. No. When I say you are right, it means I was also right. Not just you. You are right, and I was right. When I say I was wrong, there's no more, no more opening for anything. I say I was wrong, that means you won 100%. But if I say you are right, that means it doesn't mean I wasn't right. You're also right. I give it to you. I'll throw you a bone. Why is it ego? The ego. It's all about ego. The world is destroyed for ego now. Everything Putin does is 100% ego. Of course, it's all Hashem. Hashem directed it that way. They never dreamed they're going to be months in Ukraine now. And, and You know how many Russian soldiers died? More than 30,000, I think. Every hour, Russia lose $15 million in Ukraine to maintain the army. $15 million per hour. Russia is totally bankrupt. Totally bankrupt would take them 200 years to fix their financial damage. Why you continue? You destroyed Ukraine. Enough. That's it. You, you made a point. They'll never dare to join NATO. They'll never dare to tickle Russia ever again in the next 100 years. Enough. You made a point. No. They are Nazis. That's what he says. They are Nazis. I will wipe them out. But you're wiping yourself out. Let it be. As long as I bury you. Eliyahu Navi came to, to, to a guy that hates his neighbor very much. He said to him, today it's your lucky day. Everything you ask, I'm giving you. In one condition. That whatever you ask, I give your friend double. The, your enemy. The neighbor. You want a million dollars? You have it. But he's going to get two. Your enemy. You want 10 million? You get it. You'll get 20. Guess what he said to Eliyahu Anavi? Oh, yeah? Yes. Poke one of my eyes. Why? <laughs> that you should poke both of his eyes. I at least will be able to see with one. My enemy will be blind. I'm happy. That's, people, that's how people are sometimes. It's not a shame we shouldn't be like this. We should know what's right and wrong. Always focus on improving, listening, learning, and practicing what we learn. Not just learning for the sake of learning. It's not college here. It's learning for the sake of practicing. Learning without practicing, it's pure stupidity. Because it's burning time and money. And it's not productive. What's the point of learning? 
Learn על מנת לעשות, לומד על מנת לעשות. לומד על מנת ללמד. חז"ל always are very very precise. Learn in order for you to practice, otherwise it's worthless. Learn in order, or order for you to share your knowledge with others and teach them that they should also do. Otherwise it's nothing. Just gaining knowledge and not sharing it to the world and not practicing it, it's nothing. It's really nothing. But I put thousands of hours into that learning. Bad for you. The sake of learning is to practice. You learn how to put filin in order for you to put filin. You learn how to keep Shabbat because you must keep Shabbat. Learning all the laws of Shabbat and still sitting with the television and smoke on Shabbat with the remote control. What kind of a fool you are. Learning all kinds of things that you learn in lectures like this lecture. You come here, you learn 10, 20, 30 things per night. You go home, it's like you, you went to the opera. Hey, my friend, you didn't go to the opera here. It's not the theater. This is a school for life. You come here to learn how to behave. You heard about Mechalel Shabbat. His punishment is worse than a murderer in a Torah. You're supposed to get out of this door, Shomer Shabbat. Don't wait for the morning. Shabbat started tomorrow morning, then you would have to start tomorrow morning, not next week. Why? Because you just found out the truth. Going back to normal. Make nothing happen. Ezrat Hashem, I'll see you. Tomorrow we have a lecture in Queens. Thursday I'm going to be in Great Neck, and then we have Shavuot. Maybe tomorrow I'll speak about Shavuot a little bit. That's it for tonight. Baruch Adonai Leolam, Amen ve Amen. Rabbi Chamaniyah ben Akashi Yomir, Atzal Kadosh Baruch Hu Lezakot, Yisrael, Lef.